And welcome to uh, celebrating the ancestors at Gundun in the Afro-Atlantic world. Um, Black Studies at City College has been going through a, a revitalization over the last three years since I've, I've arrived. And this program in some ways is a culmination of all that we've been doing. And um, you can see from you coming, it's already, already been uh, revitalized and it's on its way to becoming a really wonderful national program. Um, this past year, we've done an unofficial theme um, across, you know, across the, uh, the year with our events. And that unofficial theme is a theme in dedication to the ancestors. This is actually our third program. Um, the first was uh, with the anthropology department. And we invited Alondra Nelson, who is the author of this amazing book, The Social Life of DNA, to speak. And she basically, she kind of shared with us um, her, the journey in mapping, mapping DNA and how it's become a tool for social transformation in the black community. And specifically um, spoke about the African burial ground and how that was used as a tool of empowerment by the activists there. The second program was with um, Ancestry DNA. And they came and uh, spoke to us about how DNA is mapped, um, the patterns of human migration coming out of Africa, and how they contribute to our DNA patterns. Of course, we had some select individuals testing who were a little surprised at their, their results, and we gave away quite a few DNA kits. So we're waiting on our students who received those kits to come and tell us about their DNA journey. And so now we're at our third and our last celebration, celebrating the ancestors. And of course, you know, this promises to definitely be a wonderful celebration. And we have the head of the Agungun uh, Society, the Alaba Akinshegun, he'll be here soon. And uh, members, of course, of Oyotunji Village. And with our, our two distinguished panelists, uh, well, speakers, the two leading uh, Yoruba art historians, Balaji Campbell and Professor Henry Drew. Now, it's my job at this moment to thank all the sponsors of, the event, of this event. Um, some of them are represented here. Please stand, you know, get some sort of uh, public acknowledgement for your contributions. So first, I have to thank um, Harlem Community Development Corporation and its president, Curtis Archer. The New York Council for the Humanities, and I think, is it Scarlett Rebman? She's one of our guests. Is she here as yet? Ah, Scarlett, please. Say thank you. Thank you. Our community partners, Image Nation Cinema Organization, and its founder, Moy Kansi Kamash. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it. But um, they founded the first independent black cinema here in Harlem, and I dare, dare say it's in all of New York. Uh, the Caribbean Cultural Center, African Diaspora Institute, and they have been the, the or, an organization that does these types of cultural programs that combine arts and education and kind of social, social conscious community building um, from their founding in 1976. And so we also have to thank Dr. Martha Morena Vega, who is here, okay. Manhattan Community Board 10 and the chair of the Arts and Culture Committee, Michael John Downing. Our sponsors within the college, and uh, of course, um, the college, um, City College Center for the Arts, its director, Greg Shank, who's given us this wonderful space. Greg, please raise your hand. Um, the Office of Government and Community Affairs, which is also Greg. <laughs> and the Simon H. Rifkin Fund, and the Division of the Humanities and Arts, under which um, Black Studies is host. Um, is hosted. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank my assistant director, Jody Ann Francis, and she's out milling about. Uh, she's the person behind the scenes who just makes everything possible. And of course, all our student volunteers who only get paid with thanks, you know? So please indulge us and let me introduce our Dean for Humanities and Arts, Dean Eric Koch, who will kind of help us to launch this program. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And good morning, everyone. 
On behalf of the Division of Humanities and the Arts at City College, it is an honor and a pleasure to welcome you to this Igungun celebration. I'd especially like to welcome our neighbors and friends of the college to our academic community for this event. A tradition, as you know, originating with the Yoruba of West Africa, Igungun has followed the African diaspora to us here today. It is a celebration of ancestors, of connection to the past that we will recreate and revisit here today. Thank you all for joining us for this important event. I'd also like to join uh, Dr. Sterling in uh, acknowledging and thanking our principal presenters here today. Uh, first, Chief Aladba Akinchegun, head of the Ikungun Society of Oyotunji Village in South Carolina. Uh, Dr. Balaji Campbell, uh, from the who is the department chair in history of art and visual culture at the Rhode Island School of Design. And Dr. Henry Druel, F. Chu Baskin, Professor of Art History and Afro-American Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Welcome to all of you. Uh, we are deeply privileged to have you here with us today to help uh, guide us in our understanding of this celebration. Uh, I'd also like to, we missed one person in Dr. Sterling's list of people to thank. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our incomparable Professor Cheryl Sterling, Director of the Black Studies Program at City College, whose energy and effort, <laughs> yes. Her energy and effort has made today's gathering possible, so thank you. And again, a very warm welcome to you all.
Is everybody up now? Ashe, Ashe. Can I get an Ashe? Ashe? Ashe. So what we just done is set the tempo, if you know what that means. That means that from this point on until we are done with our celebration, all the way until we get outside, we want y'all to get connected with your ancestors, get connected with yourself, get connected with the rhythm, the motion, and the visual that you, are, that you have experienced so far. I share? I share. What we're going to do is a uh, opening prayer. Uh, this is a prayer that we do in the Yoruba language of southwestern Nigeria. My name is Alagba Akinshegun. I am the chief of staff of Egbe Egungun, the Egungun Society of Oyotunji African Village, located in Sheldon, South Carolina. I thank y'all for having us, myself and the Egbe Egungun, to uh, introduce and further explore the veneration of African ancestors and ans worldly ancestors here in the United States. Uh, we will start off with an opening invocation. One second. Okay, and we start off by saying, Omi tutu, ona tutu, ile tutu, tutu la voye, she tutu, she tutu. Olo du mare a juba, e bora juba, bogbo hun temle solo du mare, i ba a la torun. Mo juba bogbo i ko luwa, i ba a la torun. Mo juba, o ba e funta la, i ba a la torun, o ba a waja. Mo juba bogbo i ku nimbi, mo juba bogbo i ku ti dile nimbi, mo juba bogbo i ku ti okun. Majuba Bog Boy Ku ni new metal passage. Majuba get a nimbo, he bada to room, Majuba Dagba, he bada to room, Majuba Baba Eleka, he bada to room, Majuba on Nida, he bada to room, Majuba Egungun ye ye, he bada to room, Majuba Amaye Gun, he bada to room, Majuba Oya to sin, he bada to room, Oya to be a gungun, he kuti a ye atumba o a ki a yellow ja or munile, a ki a gungun leji, cosi ele mu ti mu egun reo, a ki e bora. Aki bogbo iku ti nibi, ti bogbo inya nibi, ni nu uh, Ileka uh, City College of New York, Harlem, New York. Jowo jowo, toju awa, nikba ti awa she, ishe ni uh, uh, egungun, ishe she, egungun, ishe dale yoruba. Kikin ma she on ife, kikin ma she ala fin o yo, kikin ma she o ba a deju yigbe o lo yo otunji, kikin ma she bogbo alagba, kikin ma she bogbo yagan, kikin ma she bogbo akewe, kikin ma she bogbo oje, kikin ma she bogbo o mo ato kon ni egbe e gungun, kikin ma she bogbo o lo sha, kikin ma she bogbo o lo risha, kikin ma she bogbo babalawo, yani fa, boko no, kikin ma she bogbo a she nimbi, kikin ma she bogbo a she ko wanile. I go ile, I go ile iku, I go ile get a nimbo, I go ile bora, a fe, she, ipade, a ti, she, e gungun, e gungun fe, wala ye, a fe, e gungun wala ye, a dagba o, a fe, e gungun wala ye, e gungun ye ye o, a fe, e gungun wala ye, a oba, e fonte la o, a fe, e gungun wala ye, o lo ye, a jam o, a fe, e bogbo e gungun, ti igbe, o mo re, soke, 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 a ki, bogbo e nga, ni bi, a wa soro, a dupo e fun wa, I do pray for in Dilewa, I do pray for in Lera, Jowo Jowo, told you our Cosi Ku, Cosi Avon, Cosi Offo, Cosi Asielu, Cosi Jamba, Cosi Einstein, Cosi Fitigbo, Cosi Burubu, Cosi Akoba, Cosi Jagun Jagun, Cosi Olopa, Cosi Bogbo, Cosi Ariku Babawao, Toto To, Ibani Eshu. Can everybody say Ashe? Ashe? Ashe. Thank you. Morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here, and uh, I consider myself extremely privileged to speak a little bit about the Gungun tradition. Baba Tunde, the Alagba, is a little bit difficult to follow without invocation. Uh, but I must equally pay respect uh, to not only my elders, but also those who are even younger than me. Uh, I'm, I, I like to do it in the Yoruba way. Mosheba, Koda Mosheba Sheda, Mosheba Gbagbatin Belo Deaye, 
Mushiba o mode Mushiba agba Mushiba o birin Mushiba o kunrin in a nutshell is just paying homage and respect to our elders to the young to the old to men and women but more precisely because i want to speak today about the role of women in this intriguing cultural tradition uh, especially pay respect to women yami ejeko jumise o give me utterance and this is particularly important because in a couple of days, I will be celebrating women. And, uh, but I, I want to crave your indulgence before I divulge anything that I wasn't supposed to do. Egungun uh, is a very intriguing tradition. When I first experienced this way back in Nigeria as a little boy growing up, uh, in Yoruba land in the 60s, I was always very terrified. Uh, you hear the drum music, you see the movement, and you're frightened. But mine wasn't as dramatic as my immediate junior brother, who would always run, uh, look for my father's bedroom, and go under the bed. Because it is the presence of the otherworldly power, otherworldly force. And so that mystique is always there. But just about 10 years ago, I went back to Nigeria to begin to document Egungun to be a part of it. And I saw it from a completely different perspective. That fear had virtually disappeared uh, because I then began to develop a much more mature uh, response to Egungun and to research, to ask questions about the salient aspects of the tradition. So I want to share with you just a little bit about some of his history. Uh, I may leave out some of uh, you know, the, the, the myth. It is believed amongst Yoruba people that Shango, uh, the legendary ruler of Oyo was probably the fourth Alaf, who reigned around the 14th century is thought to have introduced the phenomenon of ancestor worship. In the beginning, this was simply called Baba, that is the father. But over time, it assumed a new dimension. Egungun represents the spirits of the dead lineage head, who upon being evoked, appears as a costume figure. The evocation takes place at a special ceremony designed to give the impression that the disease is making a temporary reappearance on earth. Shango had tried in vain to secure the remains of his late father, Onoyo, the founder of Oyo for burial at Oyo, Katunga, because Oranya had died at Ileife. Shango was, however, persuaded that this was not going to be possible because Oranya had metamorphosized into a stone staff, or Pa Oranya. So, in the alternative, he designed new funerary rites for Oranya at Oyo. At that special ceremony, he brought the reincarnated spirit of his father to the outskirts of Oyo by setting up a bara, that is a royal mausoleum, for his worship and placed Iyamode, an old woman, in the palace in charge of the mystery. Our duty was to worship the spirit and to bring him out as a masquerade during an invocation ceremony. Later, that ceremony, this ceremony of bringing the spirit of the diseased head of the lineage to the homestead became formalized as permanent feature of Yoruba funeral ceremony. As an institution, it came to be administered by the Oje, a guild of mass actors or theatrical performers based at the courts and supervised by Yamode. By the middle of the 16th century, during the reign of Allah of Yoruba, the guild had been consolidated and constituted as an Egungun society with a well-defined hierarchy of officers and priests. 
The festival phase began with Esa Ogbe Ologbojo, an official court and member of the Egungun Society, inaugurated the Festival of All Souls uh, at, during the reign of Oba Abiodun Adeguri Olu, uh, who reigned between 1775 and 1789. Esa collaborated with Eruba Miyabimbowo, the Queen Mother, mother of uh, Oba Adeguri Olu, and the woman provided Esa Ogme with a lot of exotic fabrics, some of which were head ties, as well as uh, uh, sash, used in tying baby on the back. So from his very beginning in ancient city of Oyo, through contemporary manifestations, women have played strategically important roles in the multifaceted yet in intriguing aspect of Igungun. Of the positions ascribed to women, one is hierarchical and the others are determined by circumstance or accident of birth. Each presupposes the role such women will play in the hierarchy of the cult. Usually, women who are born with the umbilical cord on the chest are considered ato. As that umbilical cord uh, metaphorically refers to the whip, atori, which you might have noticed that the guide held in his hand while we had this performance here. Atori functions in the final funeral rites for members, either as entertainment when young men flog each other as a test of endurance or as part of the strategy of maintaining some level of control over non-initiates and also as part of the shrine in installation on graves of departed ancestors. The position of the female child may also be predetermined because children born with the membrane are regarded as natural maskers from the other world. Hence, such female children, while not necessarily allowed to mask, function as guides or leaders in their respective Egungun group. The third and final category of women who may act as leaders is the category of children who are born as in the set of triplets, Ibeta. If the third child is a female, it is assumed that their roles have already been predetermined. Hence, these special children are usually referred to as etaoko, eketao more, sometimes derisively called eshulein beji, eshu, you know, the, uh, the trickster. But more axiomatically, the position of the torture in a set of triplets is conceptualized as that crucial member that maintains the principles of balance, similar to the trepidate composition of art stones. Hence, the foregoing underscores the supportive nature and indispensability of each of the children best exemplified in the Yoruba saying, Aharometa Tiki Dobenu. In the category of the hereditary leaders, such leadership positions or role are conferred based on their shared interest. And we have such women leaders uh, having the title of Iyagon, Iyamode, Iyagbaoje, and Yeyerosun, which in principle are all honorary chieftain titles that could be taken by any prominent member in the community who is interested in the preservation of cultural history and memory. In essence, women remain at the center of the decision-making organ of the cults, and these include the commissioning and creation of the mask, the construction of the costumes, including the selection of fabrics, determining the choice of colors, and the arrangement of the numerous searches which constitute the very essence of the intriguing panoply of materials reinforcing the notion of immortality. Above all, they are also the guides who lead and determine the routes that the mask performer will take as the parade round the old walls of the ancient city. Having said all of this, I, I'm going to contrast a few images here, images taken in Yoruba land with images uh, taken quite recently in 2014 uh, in Oyojunji village in Sheldon, South Carolina. Okay. 
So here uh, we have women who provide uh, leadership, who act as guide uh, during the course of public procession of Egungun. Over here, uh, I have image, an image showing uh, a Jofo Ibo Fabumi uh, who had to seek the sanction of the head of the masquerade group in Ibadan in order to initiate the performance of Egungun within our own lineage. And this had to be done uh, a year ahead uh, before the public performances of Egungun. And uh, here uh, is part of the uh, food offering place uh, right at the bottom of uh, the newly commissioned costume. Uh, and these include uh, cola nuts, um, bitter cola, as well as a moi moi, uh, a kind of bean, bean pudding. Uh, in this slide, we have images of uh, Shango dancers wearing uh, the ritual skirt. Uh, the ritual skirt is very important here because they reference some of the lappets that we see uh, when Egungun dance. So I want to go to um, South Carolina. From May 23rd to June 2nd, 2014, Professor Henry Drew and I, together with our eagle-eyed uh, videographer, Aaron Granite, documented the 2014 Egungun Festival at Oyotunji African Village. Beginning first with the scatatko uh, rhythms of uh, bata drums and the energetic dance steps of Egungun and its accompanying performance, which chanted si several melodious songs, the otherworldly performers were irradiated into the human community. Some of the song lyrics repeated multiple times in Yoruba include Egungun Tideo, De 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 La Tornu Bawaye, literally reminding us of the arrival of the august visitors from the other world or on the abode of departed Yoruba ancestors into the world of the living Iliaye. From the moment of his highly anticipated arrival, from the sacred heaven, Igbale. The Max performer is guided by the commanding presence of prominent women leaders in the community, led no doubt by Chief Obabi or Shadele. But b before I uh, continue, uh, here uh, in this slide, we have the founder of uh, Oyotunji African Village, uh, Obato Waja, Efuntola uh, Adelabu, Adefumi on the left. And in the, on the right is the uh, current reigning monarch, uh, Oba Adejuibe uh, Adefumi II. So uh, the members of the Egungun Society are led, you know, with drumming and singing and chanting the parade around the community and each of the possessions begins at the southern fringes of the village, at the expansive courtyard and shrines to Olokun and Oshun, where there is a long list of prominent African diasporic women leaders, uh, together with some diseased matriarchs of the community conspicuously displayed on the inside of the sculpture frame in the shrine. And the long list here include Iya Obadefumi, Mama Keke, Oshunfunke, Queen Mother Mo, Chief Winshehun Osabi, and Oshun Ladi. And the list also includes many accomplished African diaspora women who have made significant contributions to the social, cultural, and economic emancipation of peoples of African descent in general. We have Madam C.J. Walker, Sojourner Truth, Rosa Park, Ida Wells, uh, Celia Cruz, to mention but a few. Thereafter, there is a quick parade through the markets and the village square where the other world performers make mandatory stops at the shrine of Mamaloja, matriarch of commerce and the market square, uh, Orisha Oya, consort of Shango and goddess of the wild wind and the river Niger. Mamaloja is possibly the diasporic e equivalent of IJ Ogungulusa Oniso Iboji, deity of the market square and controller of commerce and trading activities. The Egungun entourage then 
was then ushered into the sacred arena by Chief Ayobumi Shongode, another priestess of Oya, the embodiment of the reincarnated spirit of the goddess and the famed matron of Egungun. The priestess of Oya subsequently began directing the Egungun performances at this stage, leading them through a series of shrines and symbolic spots on their journey into the physical world. The song lyrics changes to Egungun Waleo, Egungun Waleo, Atumbade, Oya Jade, Egungun is here, spirit of Oya descend. Then, this is followed with the melodious chorus of Araonu King King Iba Iba. Inhabitants of the world, all the world welcome, we pay you much homage. One of the most critical sites visited by the masquerader at this stage is the, uh, in the parade was the quick visit to the shrine of Eshu, the Orisha of the Crossroads, agent, provocateur, and god of communications, which is, which is strategically located to the right, uh, a few feet away outside of the palace walls. Thereafter, the procession enters the royal courtyard. Okay, I think it's going too far, all right. The procession enters the royal courtyard, makes a quick stop on the right at the ubiquitous shrine dedicated to the royal ancestors from Africa, simply designated the Bara of the ancestors. This is probably a dedication to the spirit of some of those countless ancestors who perished during, during the traumatic transatlantic passage. Then the entourage enters another unit to the west of the grand courtyard. Here we encounter the shrines of Orisha Oguignon, Orisha Batala, and Shango. Next to the wall on the utmost, utmost part of the courtyard are the grave sites of diseased leaders of the community, including Mama Keke, Oshunfunke, and Chief Orishamola Awolowo, the first Alagba, head of the Egungun Society, and Chief Priest. Chief Awolowo was a famous dramatist and accomplished performer who has starred in the legendary Roots television series Alex Eli, by Alex Eli. Uh, the masquerade paid customary homage at the graves of these diseased leaders before leaving for the mausoleum of the late ruler, Oba Adefumi, uh, located at the edge of the private quarters of the royal household. It was at this location in front of the mausoleum that, of Oba Adefumi that members of the royal family and his entourage would join the Egungun procession. The king is then eroded into the gathering with the chanting of the song, asking the rhetorical question, Kilam for Bakwe, meaning, how do we address the ruler? And the response is Obalashe, Obalashe. The ruler who wields secret power and authority, Obatoto Biaro, Oba who is daintily clad, as distinct and refined as the droplets of the indigo dye. This is then followed by yet another participatory call and response song, Guluso Abiyamo Feinso, Guluso Abiyamo Feinso the epitome of backward motion dance of motherhood, uh, a, type of, a type of children's uh, lullaby, which recognizes the preeminent position of our mothers as the very foundation of Yoruba society and by extension, human community. Immediately after this brief reception, the party leaves for a public gathering place, which uh, carefully, with carefully orchestrated dance steps in response to the energetic drum music and captivating songs in the Yoruba language. After all of these introductory uh, performances, uh, I, I'm just going to speak a little bit about uh, maybe four of the masquerade created specially uh, to honor departed ancestors, and these were done uh, by women. Uh, women were the ones who commissioned the masquerades. And I want to begin with the one uh, here on the screen, uh, created uh, by our Royal Grace, uh, Olamiji Pierce. Uh, and this is in honor of our late great-grandfather, uh, who was uh, a member of the British Royal Navy. Uh, she discovered this by, you know, going on Google and uh, researching, and there she was able to make connections with her ancestral past. Although her mother is African American and her father uh, a professor uh, in Nigeria, 
uh, she was able to establish that long connection uh, with a past uh, ancestor who was at some point in the past enslaved and uh, captured and taken to Syria alone uh, when she was freed uh, by the Navajo Marines on the, on the waters after you know, slavery had been, uh, by, had been abolished in the British Empire. Uh, but she was subsequent, he was subsequently taken to Syria alone and educated and sent back to Nigeria. So this masquerade here is in honor of that ancestor. Uh, the next one here uh, was commissioned by the da Adaramola uh, lineage. Uh, here, a uh, royal grace here in the photograph, uh, wife of uh, the first uh, Olo Yotunji of Oyotunji. Uh, she commissioned this masquerade here, and it was also performed uh, during this festival. Uh, the third one here uh, was commissioned by uh, Shango, uh, Oshun Princess Oshun Toki Mujisola, uh, who was trained uh, in uh, Ernie Dilogun and uh, all the rituals of Oshun, uh, both in Nigeria as well as uh, in the US. And so she has uh, this uh, Igungun in honor of Oshun. The last one uh, that I equally selected was uh, commissioned by Shango Deji Ifa, Ifa Jishe, uh, which uh, celebrates the Ala Kochetan uh, lineage of our ancestor. Uh, and so this, these are some of the ways in which the cultural tradition in Yoruba land you know, continues in this part of the world uh, and is thriving in South Carolina. And what I've observed is that both in Nigeria as well as here uh, in the United States, women seem to play a very prominent role in the celebration of the ancestors. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Campbell. Um, we'd like to show a short film of the um, Egungun ceremonies in Oyotunji village, a uh, whirling of the ancestors. So if you just bear with us as we switch media, it may take just a moment. And so, you know, I know there are people who have to go for classes and people are looking for seats, so this may be an opportunity to, to do all of that, okay? And the ancestors for their presence among us. Egabo. Egabo. I welcomed you. A welcome is the start of a conversation. It has what I've said to you. You've got to say something back to me. It's the start of a conversation. When I say ekabo, you say oh. Ekabo. Oh. All right. And I also greet you eku adu egu. I welcome you to this celebration of the ancestors. It's our kind of mini festival for the spirits of those who have passed on. Welcome to you all. Um, and uh, in the, well, let me start first by adding to the juba that Chief Alagba made and Bolachi also made, because I need to honor my ancestors and those who have brought me to this place. Um, we started that ijuba um, with uh, cooling water placed on the ground. Well, I just happened to have a little Cuban rum. So we're going to heat it up a little bit with another libation. Because I know they like some rum with their water. I show. I show. I show. All right. I think we are now well lubricated to honor the ancestors. Um, with my ajuba, I want to thank all those masters and teachers who taught me something about Yarba thought and life. 
those who are still with us in this world who continue to enhance us with their art and with their spirit. And this is my ajuba and memory for all of those who are no longer with us, who are on the other side. Because as the Yoruba say, aye locha orunile. This world is a marketplace we come to briefly, but the other world is home. So they've gone home, and we'll all be joining them at one time or another as well. Um, in addition to that, Ijuba, I want to do something else that I learned from one of my teachers, Danny Dawson over here, who will always dedicate his talks to various people. And there are lots of important people in this room. Um, but the ones I'm going to mention are Danny himself, Danny Dawson. So it's dedicated to him. It's also dedicated to Bolach Campbell and to Chief Alaga and the community in Oyotuji. To my brother John Mason sitting here, who has taught me so much, and to Cheryl Sterling for putting this program together. And uh, I can't forget my partner, um, Sarah, who is affectionately known as Ayapa, that is the queen. So those are the people I'm dedicating this talk to. And I think we're about ready. You've been watching, uh, I'm gonna be talking about the senses and a gungo as a multi-sensorial experience. I've been thinking about this whole approach to arts, culture, and history. That is that we are the products of countless multi-sensorial experiences ever since we were in our mother's wombs. What she ate, what she heard, how she moved, those are all part of our pre-birth uh, experiences, sensory experiences that shaped us as the people we became after we learned and joined culture. So this approach I'm developing is, I call, sensiotics, sensiotics. The study of the senses in the creation of persons, of social beings, of cultures, of histories, and of the arts. So a gungo, I think, epitomizes that, as you have been able to see with the opening performance dance by uh, an ancestor from Oyotunji, and as you've seen from Porto Novo and Oyotunji in this film. They've been dancing for us. Now it's time for us to dance for them. So I'm going to start with the sense of motion, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later on, which is crucial and very important in Yoruba culture. But to get in that mood and to follow the rhythm and feel the rhythm that Chief Alagba was telling us about, I want you to listen to and now stand up and dance to Ricardo Lembo as he plays for you Mambo Yo-Yo. And let's hope this works. Get up, y'all. Start to go y'all. Tush. Mambo yo yo. 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 Mambo mambo. Mambo yo yo. Mambo mambo.
Now I think I'm ready to maybe talk a little bit, but before I do, I want to acknowledge another person from the royal family at Oyo Atunji, Omar Obama. Let's ask her to stand up. That's the first part of this brief talk on the importance of the senses, the sense of motion. Um, I learned that lesson early on when I was living in Yarbalan in Nigeria, because um, I went to one of the first parties that I was invited to by friends, and of course, the party always has music, always has food, always has dancing. Okay, so I came fresh from New York City, more precisely Brooklyn, and I was doing my Brooklyn Boogaloo, which was not appropriate because I was not culturally competent about how I was supposed to move, being who I was as a newcomer. So my friend Rufus Orishayomi tapped me on the shoulder and he says, Ishola, because that was my Yoruba name. He said, Ishola, let me tell you the first principle of Yoruba dance. Okay, Rufus, yeah, tell me what it is. And I'm still doing my boogaloo thing. He says, Ishola, the first principle of Yoruba dance, do not disturb yourself too much. <laughs> and he was teaching me not just dance move, but how to be in the world. Because I was, I was of a certain age and I was supposed to dance in a particular way. Because dance and outer movement is an expression of who you are as a person. And it was my first lesson in learning cultural competence in terms of the sense of motion among the Yoruba, which is very important as you see with our dancing ancestors. Uh, so this was the start of it, and I want to tell you a little bit, um, I'm going to have you listen to another piece of music from Victor Uwaifu. So Victor Uwaifu is not Yoruba, but he's Edo. This is his music called Guitar Boy. Listen to it for a little while with your eyes open. who seduced me and uh, I've written about and done an exhibition. Um, did you notice any difference in listening to music with your eyes open as opposed to your eyes closed? I, I see some folks nodding yes, why, how, what's up? Hmm? Imagination, imagination kicks in when your eyes are closed, what else? Danny? Ah, so you're hearing different pitches. Uh, in relation to eyes open and eyes closed, yeah. And I think I, I use that as a beginning because as it's, I think it's a good, a very simple, but a very graphic example of how we privilege certain senses over other senses at all moments of our being. But they're all happening simultaneously, but we tend to either focus or, uh, on one as opposed to the other, but they're all happening, and it's the tells us and reminds us about the importance of uh, those multi-sensorial experiences that are happening all the time. And it's that perspective that I think will help us to understand culture, understand ourselves, understand many other things because we are the product of those multi-sensorial moments. Um, that previous slide that I showed you uh, of the textile, well, Let's, yeah, okay, thanks, Bulaji. <laughs> um, is an aquete cloth. 
And Sir Victor Owaifo was a wonderful musician, but he started as a visual artist. And he was actually a synesthete. That is, he was a person for whom different senses merged together and overlapped one another. So when he saw colors, he heard sounds. And when he heard sounds, he heard or saw numbers. So there was a kind of mixing of the various senses. And he said that he was inspired by these aquete claws that are woven by Igbo women in eastern Nigeria to create what he called uh, his aquete sound. And he goes on to say that do, the sound do, was black for him because it was strong. Re was red. Mi was yellow. And so on and so forth. Those colors meant rhythms, they meant sounds. And that's where he combined the visual arts of aquete weaving with the sounds of his aquete music. Now, this was the topic that got me, in, so in, well, it was a, a topic that, uh, that attracted me a great deal. You're looking at uh, Gelade Masquerader. The Gelade masking tradition, there are many masking traditions, not just a gungu among the Yoruba, and they honor different um, presences, spiritual and worldly presences. Gelade is a masking tradition that honors the mystical powers of women. So again, it's most appropriate that this is happening just before Mother's Day, right? Balaji mentioned it in his talk. And in, and in his talk in showing the role of women in the Egungun society. Well, Gelade, performed by men, danced by men, uh, honors the mystical or spiritual powers of women, their ability to bring life into this world and take it out if necessary. Um, Gelade attracted me because it is a, is it, it's a performance tradition that combines carved masks, elaborate cloth costumes, leg rattles, I don't know if you can see them so well, but leg rattles that are imitating or repeating the, the con uh, complex rhythms of the drum ensemble. So there's lots of drumming. There's also singing. And the festival involves food, marketplace, because this happens in the marketplaces which are controlled by Yoruba women. So the smells of Yoruba food fill the air during an, a, a Gelade festival. Um, I did my first book uh, on Gelade. Um, and while I was doing that research, um, we, I was going to an Igumu, uh, an, a Gelade festival. Uh, and I told the held, I happened to tell the Gelade uh, head of the society that I was a carver, because I had done two carving workshops with Yoruba sculptors when I first lived in Nigeria, and that changed my life. Um, so he said, oh yeah, Oibo, you white man, you make a, okay, let's see if you can carve a Gelade mask. Uh, that was the challenge. So that red face mask that you see in the slide is mine. And I think, uh, I think it's still dancing today um, I've been, well, thank you for that. That's the first time my art has ever gotten applause. I uh, appreciate that. And I've been waiting for it to turn up at Sotheby's at a high price. Done. <laughs> so far, it hasn't made it there. So it's still dancing in the town of Ilaro. That's Gelade. And let's you, uh, just to, so you can see the, some of the artistry of Gelade performance, uh, we have this clip. Watch this guy in the foreground with the red. He's gonna come back in and he's a master dancer.
I started with the sense of motion because it's so important, as you can see, and have you, you've experienced already with the Egungu. The Arab have two sayings about motion that are important. One is that uh, not standing still is dancing. Aiduru ijoni. And the second is, and this was one that we have used on various occasions when we invite people to party, said, stretch out your leg and let dance catch it. <laughs> it's saying something about motion. Motion has its own kind of spirit and life that catches us. And that's what brings us to life and brings us to, to culture. Okay, let's move on now. I'm gonna turn now for so a few examples, just two, two, two or three examples on a gung gung uh, before concluding. Um, this Egungu masquerader is one that honors warriors. Um, Yoruba land went through almost a hundred years of warfare. And it was as a result of those wars that so many Yorubas were taken as captives and sold into slavery and carried to the, to the Americas, mainly to Cuba, to Brazil, Trinidad, and other places. But the families of Yoruba land honor their ancestors of the 19th century. And this was one of them. He's surrounded by his attendants, his posse, a bunch of rough, tough guys, teenagers who were of soldier age, soldiering age. Now, this masquerader makes its presence known not just in its aggressive running and, uh, and uh, and action in relation to its audience, as you saw in the film from Porto Novo, lots of those masqueraders dispersing the crowd, running um, uh, aggressively. Well, when this warrior masquerader comes out, he does exactly the same thing. He creates the ambiance of warfare. Everybody knows that that's what's about to happen, and that's what the best way to honor an ancestor who showed the courage and the strength and the power to become a warrior in the past. So those are things that are happening in the Egungo festival when he comes out. But even before people see him, they sense him because they smell him. The powerful thing about this masquerader is his stench. Because that tunic that he wears is filled, coated with layers and layers and layers of dried blood of offerings that have been made, animal offerings, sacrificial offerings that have been made to enhance and to intensify the power and the presence of that masquerader. So it's the sense of smell that you know a warrior is coming. Not necessarily the sense of sight or the sound or the actions, but it's all of those things together. Let's take a look at another type of igungu, very similar to the ones you've seen in the film and from Oyotunji. These are masqueraders that honor the collective ancestors of lineages, of families. Now let's, uh, <laughs> of cloth or lappets of cloth layered. The oldest ones on closer to the body, uh, other ones from the outside. Um, and the main choreography is whirling, as you saw in the film. So um, in an exhibition that uh, we're about to do and we've done in the past, we call it the whirling return of the ancestors. Um, and that's also to honor another person that, whose name I want to mention here, too, who has told us so much about the importance of motion in African art, and that's Robert Farris Thompson, African art in motion. So the whirling return of the ancestors 
is what happens. And when they whirl, they create a breeze. And as Yarov has told me, they create a breeze of blessing. It's a blessing. It's seen as a blessing. The feeling of the breeze is the, is the presence of those invisible ancestral spirits that come among us briefly. Now, I've talked about some of the senses. Um, I'm talking about seven for the Yoruba, the standard five that we all know and think about. Sixth being the sense of motion. And the seventh is extra sensory perception or supra sensory perception. Some of us think of it as ESP. It's coming out of an intuition. It's coming out of a concern or at least a, a feeling that we may think we know the world, but in fact there may be something beyond what's beyond our comprehension and, and feel things that we can't see or taste or smell. Uh, extrasensory perception is also related to altered states of consciousness, that is trance, where people who are trained and prepared go into an altered state of consciousness to link themselves, to connect to those forces, those spiritual forces that we know are there, but, and we feel sometimes, um, and sense sometimes. Trance is crucial to all religious practice, whether in Christianity, in Islam, and certainly in Africa, and among the Yoruba, where priests and priestesses, egungun, diviners, and others go into altered states of consciousness. As the Yoruba explain it, they say, ah, ah, ori wu mi, ori mi wu, my head swells, and it swells with spirit, and that's the moment when you go to somewhere where you haven't been, and you connect to those spirits. So you're looking at two images of women who are in those altered states of consciousness. On the left, a devotee of Mami Wata, Mother Water. She's there at the, at the shore of the ocean, at the Atlantic Ocean, and she's with her paddle trying to get closer and closer to the divinity that she honors and respects. And on the right, you see a priestess of Shango, god of thunder, holding her Oshie Shango in the dance. She too is in that altered state of consciousness. So as you look at them, you're seeing not only two powerful women, you're also seeing the spirits that animate their souls. That's the extrasensory perception part. And now I'll conclude as you look at this bead, Yoruba beadwork from a catalog that John Mason and I did on Yoruba beadwork. Um, it's an interlaced motif, and it's a Yoruba vision of infinity, of the continuity of birth, life, passage out of life, and a possible return in via reincarnation. Uh, and it's about that dynamic of continual infinite spirit and life. And I'm closing now with uh, the words of a uh, friend and colleague, Labi Yai, who talks about Yoruba artists. Yoruba artists are known as onishonna, those who make onna, or art. Art, I would define as evocative form. So these are people who, among us, are creating evocative sounds in music, drumming, evocative motion in dance, beautifully tasteful food as well. All of those arts are on uh, evocative form. And Lavi says that the Yoruba expect their artists who make all of these evocative forms, they have to be itinerant people. That is, they're constantly on the move. They're strangers everywhere. They're at home nowhere. Because they're constantly on the move, as Yai says, engaged in constant departures of creativity. 
That's what Yoruba philosophy, Yoruba culture has brought to us. It's brought it to me, it's changed my life. And I hope it can help change yours. Thanks very much. So now you've been privileged to, you know, see what I saw for a few years as he is my professor from graduate school. <laughs> so I'd like to invite all of the panelists to come up. We'll need someone to help us move the table. And since we have a couple of some distinguished uh, members of our audience, uh, maybe you could help serve as our interlocutors, you know, of our pan panelists. Danny Dawson and John Mason. I didn't, Martha, would you like to, you know, join? No. <laughs> all right, all right. So we'll have a, a, a Q&A there. I know I've been left with one question to ask. So, um, and so we'll open, we'll open up the floor to discussion and questions. Uh, I have a question. I, I, I was I'm surprised that Egungun could run so fast. You know, is, is there a tradition, a thing about speed in Egungu, particularly about running? Because I know that the kids are scared to death and then you know, they can be outrun by those grown men. And then the Egungu in the United States is running after cars. So I'm saying this is an interesting phenomenon for me. Thank you. Well, in, uh, in Egungu, in our ancestral worship, um, it became such a uh, dynamic uh, thing in our culture that uh, a gungo or a masquerade is duplicated in many other ways, many other forms. You have some a gungo that they call tombolo, which is little kids, little childs. Um, when I was a little child, young, I just looked up to the Egungu society because my father was in the Alakba and the uh, Egungu society. So we formed our own little little kid a group a gun -gun, you know and we made a gun -gun, we drummed a gun -gun chants um, um beats and sang the chants um although to actually participate in a gun -gun ceremony you have to be of a certain age you have to be part of you have to uh, pass your rites of passage and everything so so forth and so forth so uh when a gun -gun, in that same example you have different egungoons around you have every and you have Tombolo, and then you have Egungun, which is the direct uh, reincarnation or return of the ancestors. Uh, many other forms are to show that dynamic, or to express that dynamic of Egungun. But when you have the ancestors return, which is the actual Egungun, then you have that metaphysical uh, part that the uh, Dr. Jewel was talking about, which is the uh, supernatural strength, the supernatural uh, agility, the supernatural uh, uh, blessings that they can bestow on their followers. So in, in retrospect, when you see a gungu, you must know that it is going to be supernatural. There is going to be extra energy there. There is going to be something to wow you and to say this is bigger than just uh, uh, a masquerade or someone that is just uh, performing or just a performance, you know. Um, the incantation that a gungun comes out on uh, aligns the spirits with that cloth that is uh, being carried. So when you do see a gungun, you will see a lot of agility, a lot of movements, a lot of jumping up and down, a lot of uh, 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 great young uh, 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 strengths. And so that's why you see a gungun -gun surrounded by young men too. You don't see old men chasing a gungun -gun or elderly men chasing a gungun. -gun. You see a lot of young people chasing a gungun -gun because a gungun -gun has that supernatural strength. Thank you. Uh, let me just add a little bit more to what Alagba said. Uh, there are several categories of Egungu. Uh, we have the serious type uh, connected with rituals, and uh, in that respect, uh, they are considered Egungu Alagbu or those connected with uh, medicinal uh, objects. 
And we also have Igungun Etutu. Igungun meant to, to pacify, to make sacrifices so that there will be blessing and uh, abundance in the society. There will be peace. Uh, but uh, there, are, there is another category uh, that honors the lineage of uh, warriors. And uh, we saw a fine example in uh, Professor Groh's pr presentation. And in that category, you don't mess with such a uh, Some are even restricted, uh, where women may not be allowed to see the to encounter the Egungu, or even children will not be allowed. <coughs> Such a Egungu will come out maybe at night. And uh, we have those that also honor uh, hunters, or perhaps special Orisha, like Oloya, Oloshun, uh, and perhaps more importantly, we have those that entertain, which are called Tumbulu. Uh, they, they are the ones who, you know, be flipping, doing somersault, running around and scaring people. So we have so many categories of the mm -hmm. Hello. Too many things. Um, <clears throat> the point about, as a musician, for more than half a century, I'm always intrigued by why Ancestral music and gungu music was always a little tad faster than music for other Orisha. And in the Americas, and we didn't talk about Brazil, if you go to Itaparica or you go to Ashipa in, in, in um, Salvador, um, the, 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 our old friend, Gigi, this Dos Santos, is now an ancestor, but he was the architect of so much of this. But then I understood when you listen to those ensembles, when you listen to ensembles in Nigeria and you listen to the pace of the music and the pace of the accompanying oriki, because it's, it's all together. But if you go to Haiti, or you saw the dance step, and the dance reminds you of Vanda, that pelvic thrust. He, he gave a, a thrust, one of the Egungu. That's what we call Vanda. But in Fon, Vanda means to, to nail something. So the sexual connotation of, of, of Gede dancing, Gede is in the room. So that we could we see the phenomenon. It's been repeated wherever. And somebody mentioned carnival. In Brazil and even in Cuba and other places, they will tell you in Trinidad, they said death is in carnival. The old people don't go to carnival in, in Salvador, in Cuba, the old people would stay home and say, John. Oh yeah, we let it. Because death, so that we, see, and you, it's not just um, in the movie, um, Black Orpheus, but that's an actual commentary from elders, other priests and priestesses who would, who would tell you, John, is your work to go and look at, at, at Carnival this year, or this time, or whatever, and they say, oh yeah, we let and they would tell me whatever country I'm in, they would tell me, you know, carnival is where death resides. But it's, it's not just death in the sense of you're going to get robbed or something like that. It's death in the sense that that's where ancestors come back to, to have fun, but to also tell you things, to, to, to inform you of your foolishness or righteousness or whatever they come to tell you about. So that we have so many places where you see this. And this would be a great if we could have brought Brazilian egungu here because I've seen it in Nashipa, I've seen it in Itaparica, which I was, how would I put this? I'm, I'm very lucky, as the old people say. They say, you know, you're lucky because nobody would be allowed to see this or to even film it. And that's my, that's my grace, as they say. So 
That, that's my point. Anyway. I'm not a musician, but I, I have heard a couple of things about bata, the bata drum, which is special for Egungo, um, and links it to Oyo as the source of Egungo traditions. And um, drummers and others who have worked on bata music say, you know, bata is the stutterer. So he, 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 he doubles up and triples up on words and sounds. So there's a, a, there's a sound that, that seems faster. I think that may be part of it. And then also, you know, bata sound, people were likening to the clap of thunder. Again, going back to Shango, it's a real slap and sharp sound to that drum. And I think that all contributes to the energy that, that we see in, in a Google. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, in Egungo, it is personal. It is personalized, as uh, Baba Mason was talking about in Brazil or in Haiti. You would see the stress. You would see the uh, wine, or how we say it. You know, it's personalized because when we return these ancestors, when we bring back our African ancestors, we know that we're African people, but we are African over here now. So now our uh, our movements probably have changed our uh, language uh, or tone or how we say the Yoruba words are much harder and they have changed. And the, uh, the science has been passed down where you, know, you don't see the same herbs here. You would see its cousin or its, or its um, you know, in the family of those herbs. And so that's how we began to make Osain in, o, uh, in Oyotunji. And that's how we began to express Egungun, is to don't uh, keep out the rest of our ancestors. You know, on my ancestor shrine, I have Native American artifacts. I have Native American artifacts on my Egungun, on the garments that we bring out, because we always want to represent and homage all of our ancestors. So you will see uh, uh, various different Egungun as evolution of Egungun continues here in the United States and in the diaspora. Um, I employ everybody here real quick, please, everybody here to make sure that you do have an ancestor shrine because um, we're looking to help ourselves. We're always looking to save the world. And um, one of those ways that we can help ourselves is to stay connected with our ancestors. If nobody out here wants to help you, it's your ancestors that will help you and that wants to help you. When they left, they left thinking, how can I help that person or these persons or my family that I have left behind? They still want to give you that car. They still want to give you that house. They still want you to graduate from college. They still want all of those things and they're still able to help you. It is through the ancestral veneration, the science, and the processes that we go through in ancestral veneration that allow us to receive the blessings of our ancestors. Thank you. Balaji brought up a wonderful point, and I love his, his whole presentation. In Bahia, you cannot have a gungu without, without the Egbe of Obiri. Who are the chorus? They know all the songs, they know the lineage, language, because they are the ones who keep the tradition of, of Gigi, of all the Oje, all the priests of Egungu in that place. And in Itaparika, the same thing. So that without, sometimes we have this. How would I put this? Some, when we're doing divination at, the shrine, at a shrine, Oju, they, there's a part where women who have not passed their menopause have to turn. It's the same as though women cannot view certain parts of, but this is in a, a small place so that you're here, we're throwing Obi, and we're divining to see what the answer is. And the women who have not passed, their menopause have to turn their face from this. 
some, for a long time, it was misunderstood as to maybe their exclusion, all right, and, and maybe they're being demoted in some way. But when you, well, I, you, you, I've been a few places, so then you see and you find out, wait a minute, you mean you can't do this without all those women? Because then you see all these very powerful women coming from all the Tereros, even in Cuba, who are the, the keepers of Egungun tradition? They're all the old women. They know songs, they could sing songs for, the, for a week and not sing the same song twice. And you're thinking, you're kidding me. And you would think the men, oh, they are, the men are most prominent, but the women are the backbone. They are the things that everybody's setting on, in a sense, or standing on, or whichever way you want to see it. So I just wanted to compliment you on that, because it was, it was great. Because a lot of times it gets left out of, of, the, of the conversation as to, it's a, it's a holistic approach. There is nobody left out, young, old, men and women, or women and men, <laughs> more appropriately in many cases, have to be part of the process, otherwise the process doesn't work. It doesn't work, simple as that. The question is, um, uh, Gelede and its relationship to Egungu. Um, well, some members in Gelede society are probably also members of uh, Egungu, but sometimes they're not. Um, so it depends upon lineage history um, and, uh, and through divination what people need to do, which forces they need to honor, respect, and, and work for, okay? So in the Gelade society, there are women who are the head of it, along with men. Um, it's men who do the masquerading, and the masqueraders are not um, in the same way. That, well, they're, they're a bit different from Egungu, because the Egungu is the embodiment of, a, of an otherworldly spirit. Gelade masqueraders, uh, the, the masqueraders themselves, the performers themselves, can be known. Their faces can be seen. They're not thought to be in trance, okay? So there's a, a difference. So the Gelade is more focused on the spiritual powers of women, but as they manifest themselves in the world. So the masquerades honor women in various roles, men in various roles, um, and that those roles are danced. And so that's, that's the focus of Gelade. Scream like you usually do. Oh. <laughs> Hello, yes. I just came from Cuba for a, a conference about African religion. And that, that, that uh, what that you just mentioned, uh, the statement that you just mentioned, you just mentioned it, is one of the debates uh, that they put the power of the women and they demoted it. And I'm very proud that some Cubans and uh, Babalao. They just say no, and they continue the ritual, even though they got a lot of Babalao men that, like the, he said, that are against them, again, using the excuse of the period. Now, then this is the problem. I got about Oya, and the priest of Oya, and that's the way I'm very confused, because the Egungun in Cuba, the spirit of the day, is the, is the, is the, uh, the characteristic of Oya. But this is, this is my, the beauty part that I saw here, women doing the egungo. And then they, uh, they don't allow us, like the, when I was having my period, I would not allow it, but now that I got, got my period, I could do it, but it's too late. Why? Because the information, the training, it has disappeared. And then it's become kind of contradictory, but I don't wanna see it like that. It's okay, yes it is, I gotta move forward. And I'm glad that in Africa, <laughs> we got those women that 
they could do with a gungu. Now, when I come back to Cuba, I say I could do with a gungu. That's the answer to my question. Now, my other question is, is the priest or only or, or shoot that they don't, and, and keep, but this is my confusion again. I'm learning, okay, I apologize, but I just wanted to hear the tape. In Cuba, everything, what is, what is going to respond for the period of the day is the, the priest says, oh, oh yeah, I still there that when I just came in, it was the priest or oh, Ochun oh, that she was dancing for the boom boom, and that Jizia is like that. I don't want to see it, that who know better or what's wrong or right. I just want to say it for learning. That's what you want to know about that. <laughs> you got that? Boy, yeah. Yeah. In trouble. Uh, <laughs> looking for serious trouble. Uh, in Yoruba society, I don't think there is very strict dichotomy uh, in the worship and celebration of the departed uh, along gender lines. Uh, I was reminded when uh, Baba John Mason was speaking that I wake up in the morning and my father would not greet me uh, by chanting Oriki. It's always my mother who would do that. And when she chants the Oriki, uh, she takes me back many generations, acknowledging you know, uh, grandfathers uh, on both sides of, of the lineage, acknowledging mothers on both sides of the lineage. And that way, she passes on you know, the personal history family. That is the way history and cultural traditions are preserved. Uh, father will go out, you know, pursue his own business and uh, look for money in order to sustain the family. It's the mother who stays with the children. And it's from the mother that you learn uh, through oral tradition uh, the nightly stories were gathered, you know, long before television became a 24-hour affair. Uh, we only watch the TV maybe at 6 or 7 o'clock in the evening for about two or three hours growing up in the 60s. So a lot of the time, it is the folk stories that are being passed on. And who are the people disseminating this? My mother and my grandmother. So that is the way in which you know, Yoruba culture passes on that tradition. It doesn't necessarily come from the father. Are women, ex are women excluded in Egungun? I didn't exactly see that while gathering data in Ibadan, at least in the last 10 or, 10 or 15 years. Women play a very prominent role. They are the ones who chant the lineage panegyrics. They are the ones who dance. They are the ones who provide the food to feed the entire community. Yes, it is the men who are energetic, who are going to dance, and dance for two or three hours, and then take away the costume in order to be replenished. And it's also women who provide them with sustenance, in order for them to continue to gather more strength, to continue that celebration. But it also reminds me of when the cultural tradition began. It was that encounter between the priest, performer, and the queen mother that collaborated in order to create the Egun. Yes, woman considered part of you know, the, 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 the performances, the pageantry to the men, to dance energetically, to move to the rhythm of the music. But the w women are the ones who are chanting and singing and leading the masquerade on. So it is about collaboration in the society. It's, there's no very strict gender divide. 
Uh, and then to talk a little bit about the relationship of uh, Egungun and Gelede. Gelede is just one of several aspects of the masking tradition among Yoruba people. Egungun is one. We have a Yo in Lagos, we have Egungun in the Oyo speaking areas of Yoruba land. Gelede amongst the Egbadu and, uh, and those close to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, further down, I mean, further upwards in the Ekiti Hill country, you have Aladoko, you have uh, Epa, you know, uh, these are different forms of uh, cultural traditions. Although Egungun has spread as a result of, you know, the dispersal of people from the Oyo kingdom uh, when, when the kingdom, you know, uh, came to an end in the middle of uh, the 19th century. You're asking about divination. <laughs> How it's done. Twenty seconds. It, well, you know, you you have um, I guess in the United States you have like uh, the masons. How they go through steps to get to where they are. Um, these steps cannot be explained as far as this process to Ifa. You know, the uh, divination of Ifa is vast, you know. Uh, we communicate with the Gungu through Obi or cowrie shells or uh, the, the form of divination is really to connect with the spirits. It starts with Ifa, but then Oshun got it from Ifa, and then the ancestors got it, and then who knows who else will get it, you know, who, who knows how far this divination process will go as we get smarter and more aligned with our nature because we wasn't aligned with nature too well earlier but now that we are getting more into African spirituality and Yoruba culture we are aligning ourselves with nature so who knows you know you might find a way from that from that path of Ifa to Dilogun to Obi to uh, to even Misa what they call what we call Ikujoko which is where we sit with the ancestors and just read from there, you know. Um, the divination tools come from that uh, Elisha, from that temple, on how they perfected it, how that Egbe or that group has perfected it. Um, mm -hmm. Well, after you are indoctrinated to per, per, uh, uh, deal with that process, then yeah, you can go forth and proceed. You know, it is not a gender thing like a lot of people like to think. Actually, the uh, process of Dilogun came from the women, came from Oshun. So um, uh, yeah, like I was saying, you know, in the Masons, they have different cate cate uh, categories. You know, I have many Awo who are my friend. Um, if you want to say Baba Lawo, then you have to go further and, you know, seek those elders that have been strict into this, you know. You have a lot of Dilogun uh, diviners. The, what I, I'm just trying to sum up that the divination process is a big thing in Yoruba culture. And it spreads all across, it varies, and uh, I guess your research will take you more into understanding the, ans the question that you're asking. Thank you. Yeah, and my answer is ditto. <laughs> <laughs>
via Google or representing? Do they go through? Do they go through a preparation, a spiritual, a mental, physical preparation before the event occurs? Well, without hurting myself, let me just say yes and yes. Um, another thing that we must be cautious is that when we look at Egungu, but yes, yes to both questions. You know, um, we can't do this without the proper indoctrination and the uh, proper alignment with uh, Ifa Olodumare and our ancestors and Ishu. So uh, there are a lot of rituals, many rituals that goes in Egungu worship. We don't necessarily put our focus on any physical being underneath that cloth. Because when that cloth comes out, it is the ancestors. You will be uh, very confused if you look at the movements and try to tell how physically this person or this Egungun is doing this. You only have to give it up to the spirit. As you see Egungun, as you witness Egungun more in your life, you will notice that this is not a physical thing. This is a spiritual uh, 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 art piece, very spiritual art piece. And that in Oyotunji, we make it taboo or it's an offense to even talk about what's underneath the cloth because you take away from the spiritual aspect of that egungu. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we'll have Dr. Drew explain more. No, I'm going to pass it on to Balaji, then I'll say something. <laughs> Creating the costume is a collaborative venture. Uh, everyone has a part to play, uh, from the weaver uh, to the guy who embroiders. Uh, and don't forget that part of the costume, they are in strips right, or panels, and it moves from one person to the other, from, you know, the weaver to the tailor who fashion it into panels, and there it goes to the embroiderer who, you know, who, who de probably decorate the edges, and from there it might even go to somebody who puts additional beads, and packets of oh, packets of empowering substances, and from which stage then they begin to imbue it with you know, spiritual powers, the chants, the four libations. So it gets transformed from that tiny you know, piece of cotton that was probably made you know, in the workshop of the weaver. So as it goes along, it assumes a life of its own uh, until finally all of these are then assembled together to create you know, uh, the outer garment for the Egungun. But beyond the, that outer garment that we see, there is also you know, a, a different tunic underneath that may you know, be steeped in dyes, be steeped in medicinal concussion. And who is inside is part of the mystery. Uh, you cannot, you are, even if you recognize somebody based on the way they move or perhaps they dance, you cannot divulge that because when, once the costume is on their back, they become embodiment of the departed. They are no longer themselves. They have been transformed. I've seen situations where, for instance, it was a very fascinating thing that happened in 2007. I was in Nigeria waiting to watch, you know, this very powerful way who come out in Ibadan. <clears throat> and it was being delayed because the cops will not allow him to come out. Why? Simply because he has refused to sign a particular document that will more or less implicate him if there was any violence. And so there was a lot of tussle between agents of government and you know, the leaders of the group. But because I was the guest of the 
overall chief of the Egungun, the Alagba in Ibadan. So we had to go to the compound and meet the Egungun in the various stages of transformation. It was the first time for me, it was an eye-opening you know, experience. Here we were, the Alagba insisted that the man who was going to wear the mask, it wasn't exactly, you know, he didn't have the costumes on him, but he was lying down on the floor in the shrine in various stages of transformation. I don't think, you know, we're communicating with somebody who was still here. Uh, you know, there was an intermediary, but he just grudgingly, almost in, you know, a very transformed state. He grudgingly appended his signature and we're, you know, on our way. But that shows me, it confirms that by the time they leave the sacred heaven and come out on the streets, they are completely different person. And by the time they also go back and they remove the costume, certain rituals have to be performed mm -hmm. in order to bring them back, you know, to the world of the living. So that's part of the complexity. Of it, and I hope I won't get into trouble divulging, even or sharing with you this new aspect that I've seen. Yes. I think that young lady over there had a question, and then I think I find. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Open the door, and then I'm asking if it would be that young lady. Would there be differences? Definitely. But there are a lot of lots of similarities. Yoruba say Ajishebi or Jolari or Yoni Shebi and Kokon. We have people who want to be like or yours, right? But or yours will never copy anybody. Yoruba tradition is one that has diffused all over the world, and each person has the power, the agency, to interpret the religion in ways in which it's comfortable for them to relate to the essence of their being. Uh, I want to worship my ancestor. If in a Gungun tradition, the food we use is mon moi, a call will be kola not. These are grown in the tropics. If we're worshiping a gumbum here, there's nothing wrong if I toss some cake <laughs> in the offering bowl, or I put some rum there, because these are the things that the ancestor ate before they left you know, the material world. So that's the only way we can make that connection. It's not by creating this exotic food that you probably wouldn't even want to taste. <laughs> you, you don't want to chew cola, uh, bitter cola. Yeah. It's not a delicacy. Uh, but it is perhaps, you know, a staple in that part of the world. Uh, but it makes meaning for us to relate to the Orisha in way, or to relate to the departed in ways in which they can be very responsive. And that is why people have different interpretations. And there's nothing wrong with the interpretations. We keep inventing. Yoruba society of today uh, it's not necessarily the same Yoruba society that I grew up, you know, 50, 40, 50 years ago in Yoruba land. It's changing, and we do recognize that. Uh, let me allow my elders to add a little more. Yeah. 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 And Egungo Ensemble, the ones that you've been seeing here in this room and in the film and in our slides, are documents of history, family history. Those layers of cloth are layers of history. So that the oldest cloth that you don't see on the outside is actually like a shroud, a burial shroud for the departed. But then new cloth is added, layers upon layers, because that, dot, that masquerade, that ensemble, is to reflect the history and the experiences of the family members who have created it over time. 
So those histories are going to be different in Ibadan than they are from Egu or from Ijebu or Egbado or Oyotunji or New York City. And, but the foundation, the Ibileshe, is the same. It's the honoring, the respecting, the veneration of those loved ones who have gone to the other side. Thank you. Um, yeah, that, that's the great answer. Um, I would say, growing up in Oyotunji, we never was focused on a difference, or we always focused on the similarities. Yes, we have other Lukumi uh, worshipers and priests and priestesses come to the festivals, and we just admire their dance steps. You know, we just admire the different rhythms that they play. We don't really never. Um, it's, it's, it's very entertaining for us to have our brothers and sisters of the Yoruba culture come and uh, celebrate with us. So we basically, growing up, we only focus on the similarities of what we do together, you know, and that we all are Omo Dudua Yoruba people, you know. We never really looked at anything different. I know a lot of people like to look at that, but it's so much similarity and there's so much uh, unity in the culture that growing up I never was available to focus on that. You asked about a bunch of places, but think of it this way. Ola B. Yai, who Henry referred to earlier, talked about our dear friend, the genius of us all. <laughs> Little man can speak that many languages but he would he he taught us he taught me specifically he said you know when you become a man or an adult or for a woman too your father cannot come to your house and tell you i don't like that couch there because even though you respect your father your mother in your house, you put the couch where it suits you. Well, this is the same thing with Yoruba culture, with Orisha culture, that you go to Brazil, you go to Trinidad. I remember making, I wrote this in one of my books, that I made a comment at a, at a we had a little dinner party for Mother Rodney, she's passed on. She was the woman who was responsible for having Orisha culture put into the governmental respect, and they have the same rights in Trinidad as every other religion, all right? She was responsible for that. She got the amendment added to the Constitution in Trinidad, but she threw, she was telling me, and she said, oh, I, she took the banja, the, the OB, and this threw two, the two pieces, they opened it up and just threw it. So I'm in Trinidad and I'm looking at this, and in my ego, I'm thinking, poor people, they don't know to throw four pieces. I never said anything, but that was in my mind. She comes to my home and she stayed with us in, in, in East Harlem. And my dear friend, Theophilus Odro, Idijesha from Ibadro, most learned of us all, of us all, if I do say so. They call him one of the, they call him the, 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 the owner of big words because his Yoruba is in, in, impeccable and he hadn't been in Yoruba land in 25 years. All right, and this is from Yoruba speakers who, who said, my God, how did you keep your language so pristine? But what did he say? With having this conversation with Mother Rodney and Ojo, and Ojo says, oh, Baba John, my mother, when she was in a hurry, she would take the banja and just throw the two pieces for a quick answer. And Mother Rodney said, yeah, that's what we do too. We throw four. Matter of fact, they throw more than four. Sometimes they throw more pieces. Oh yeah, they throw more than four. Let's not get to that. But that's when I realized it's all the same. Just depend on what day you open the book. So you go to Cuba, 
I've spent a lot of time in Cuba, plenty of time in Brazil, in other places, and then you see from Nigeria through, and you find that it's the same ritual. I'm a diviner. I was trained as a diviner. I trained Babalahu <laughs> quietly because they don't want to let them let it be known that a Baba Lorisha was their teacher. But I was trained by a master diviner. I mean, my lineage is all of diviners. What's the point? The point of it is, Odu is Odu. Odu is Odu. You throw Oche, it doesn't matter where you are, that's Oche. It's Obara. They don't, you don't get another name. So that if you don't, if there's a one Ogun and one Shango, then what? We're all part of the same continuum. It's just that they dropped you here, they dropped me there, they dropped him there, and we're all part of it. And we all don't have to look alike to be alike. Sure. This part of the program. Yes, young lady. Is there any relation to calling upon pigs sort of Kakilanti or Kakilanti, which is also another mass dance or that they give to Dan's and Malian's? Uh, and they call upon Kakilanti, I think, once a year or once a, every seven years. And they have a specific question that they want to ask, like, you know, how this is going to be, who's going to vent, and stuff, and stuff, and stuff like that. Do they call, when you call upon the ancestors, That's three questions. <laughs> I, like, I like this. This is easy. This is getting real easy. Um, yes, yes, and yes. This, this is really easy. Uh, uh, yeah, because um, Egungun comes to give blessings, comes to answer questions, comes to uh, tell what they've seen wrong, let you know what's going wrong, give you advice. Um, this is your grandma return. So yeah, in the same sense of Kakilambe coming down to help uh, guide you for the season, the Egungun also can do that also. The Egungun is your connection to God, your personal connection to God. Um, and drumming, drumming, growing up, drumming was like basketball, you know? That's what it was, it was like basketball. Like we all had a drum, we all made a drum. We couldn't wait to make a drum. You know, we couldn't wait to learn the drum rhythms and learn the different rhythms that are associated with the different elements and the different orisha, the different uh, uh, nature, different, you know, it, it, it goes on and on and on and on as far as what you can create with the drum rhythm. And that's part of what uh, Dr. Drew was saying as far as the, uh, the rhythm gaining some type of response, getting some type of response with nature, you know. As you play the drum, nature responds to the rhythm. And nature meaning the Orisha or the Egungun or the spiritual uh, force that you're connecting to. Hopefully that's it. If not, yes, 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 yes. That'll work. <laughs> This part of our of our program, I want to kind of conclude with a, a, a very a verse from a short poem. Um, the dead are not gone forever; they are in the rustling of the tree, in the morning wood, in the flowing water, in the still water, in the lonely place, in the crowd. The dead are not dead. Eshegoni to all our panelists. Thank you. Okay, Onilua, at Onilua, um, we have a lot of my friends and elders from Oyotunji and the Yoruba uh, people. So, as you know, this is a celebration. Everybody can get up, everybody can dance, and if you know the songs, you can sing along. 
Axé Axé Axé
category of every village. And in the Egungun La, it represents all aspects of the village and how we can work together and how we can uh, unite and continue the uh, work of our ancestors. The first Egungun La that we present to you is Adakba. Adakba. punishment for those that don't follow our own self. Okay. We're doing this for ourselves. And so our Dr. says, be proud of yourself. Be proud of your community. Be proud of the things that you have established. And be judgeful for yourself. And be mindful that this is a tradition that you have started. This is something that ancestors have died now and want to see continue. And so we give homage to Adakba! Adakba! There are many other aspects of the Egungun La. We have Baba Aloko, who is the teacher. The teacher is the one who makes sure that we have information go from one to the next. The student understands, the teacher understands. The information, the books are written. The uh, drums is, is taught. The, the dances are danced and kept the same way. That is Baba Oloko. Then we have the mystic powers that nobody knows. Nobody is, is available to know everything. So we give respect to Onidan, who can go and be the chameleon, who can understand many aspects of life. That represents that X variable. A lot of people say Eshu, as we say Onidan is the Egungun La of that X variable. And last but not least, as we know the mother encounters all, we have Egungun Yeye, who encounters everything that I have just said, who covers everything that I have just said, and also protects womanhood and protects the misuse of properly proper womanhood. It is Egungun Yeye who we go to to uh, make sure that our uh, women are protected. Is there gungun yeye that we go to when any offense is done? Is there gungun yeye that we go to when we need our nurturing? We need our mothers. So we give homage and respect to a gungun yeye. And these are just the two of the gungun la. This is a category of Egungun. Also in Egungun, we have personalized Egungun, where you can bring out great people in your community. And here we have, coming forward, our great predecessors, our great leaders, the father of the African Restoration Movement, our past king, Oba Epuntola, Adepumi, and his chief, Chief Adamo. 